Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today for the Digital Youth Discussion Group. Today we have Ben Khan. He's joined us from the Delray Public Library. He started there in August of 2016 as the Children's Librarian. He's previously worked as a trom trombonist and musical director for an international cruise line, composes music, which is published independently and through third parties. He's developed some experience as a home recording artist, releasing, releasing a children's lullaby album available on CD Baby, iTunes, Spotify, and elsewhere. He recently attained an MLIS from the University of South Florida, yay, South Florida, and holds a bachelor's degree in music with selected studies in mathematics. Ben currently lives in Boynton Beach with his wife and his three-year-old son. Um, today, Ben is going to be talking about the development of the audio recording program at their library, at the Delray Public Library. Ben, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate you being willing to share um, with us your expertise. Thank you, Melanie. Glad to be here. Uh, awesome. So, yeah, as Melanie mentioned, uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Delray Beach Public Library and their audio production program. Uh, as she mentioned, uh, uh, we put in a recording studio about two years ago, and uh, since I've been here, I've been sort of in charge of developing that program. Um, so, um, just just out of curiosity, does anyone else here have um, a recording studio at their library or a podcast studio, anything like that? You guys can, um, uh, Amy does not. Okay. How about you, Dave? I know Miami has the U-Media, um, and uh, I don't think David specifically works at U-Media, but I know that... Um, okay. This library system does have new media. Okay. Well, you know, this presentation is meant to give you just a little bit of background on it. You know, if anybody is, you know, considering adding a recording space or something like that, then this should get you started. Or, you know, uh, just if anybody's interested in audio recording, this will, will get you through the basics. So, anyway, to get started, a little bit of background. Uh, as I discussed, the Delray Beach Public Library's recording studio was built in January of 2016. Uh, through a grant from the Chester Foundation. Uh, the studio is designed to be an educational facility. Uh, it is funded through an educational grant, so our focus is on education. Um, it is also part of our children's department, so it's generally for patrons under 18 for use in projects of a non-commercial nature. Uh, the space itself consists of a computer workstation, uh, which is 12 feet by 11 feet, and a recording booth, which is 12 feet by 6 feet. So, you know, the recording booth is about the size of a nice size walk-in closet. Um, the size, you know, this makes it ideal for singer-songwriters, duos, and interviews, but less so for large bands or drum sets. Uh, sometimes we get kids, you know, walking in who want to play on a drum set, and it's like, well, I wish we had the space. But um, anyway, you know, the point of all that is, you know, this has helped guide the way in which we've developed the studio. Uh, since August 2016, Ben Kahn, that's me, uh, has been responsible for purchasing much of the equipment for the studio, writing policies for the studio, developing programs, and working with patrons individually and in large groups. Lost my Your arrows probably would navigate your PowerPoint then on your computer. There it is. Okay. So, as for the planning stage, you know, purchasing of equipment, um, you know, I just want to list sort of, you know, what we had to go through purchasing, um, the things we considered when we purchased it, uh, and then some example suggestions of, you know, what you might purchase if you're interested. Um, the ones that I've highlighted in blue are items that we use in our studio here. Uh, so the first thing, you know, with a recording studio, you need a computer that's going to process all of the audio signals. Um, so the most important things to consider there are processing speed and the memory. Uh, audio files tend to be 
somewhat larger, obviously not as large as video files, but they do take up space quickly. Um, so memory is important. Processing speed is essential because you know you're processing an audio signal, which is you know a lot of information coming into your computer. Um, ours is a PC with an i3, uh, which you know I would consider that probably the minimum for what you would need to run a studio like this. Um, Mac is also very, very, very popular with audio production programs, and Mac OS X has been the standard, I think still is. Um, so once you have your computer picked out, uh, the, ne the next thing is selecting your digital audio workstation. So, you know, you've got the computer hardware, and now you have the software. Um, digital audio workstation is basically an, you know, a piece of software that does everything you would need to go from, you know, production to a finalized audio project. Um, and, you know, the one you select will be, will be determined by the types of pro projects you want to pursue and the learning curve that comes with it, because some of these programs get very, very complicated. Uh, Pro Tools is sort of the industry standard. Um, we use FL Studio in our recording studio. FL Studio, you know, it's, it's a good uh, mid-grade, not as pricey as Pro Tools. Um, it, you know, it's used... What, one of the ha highlights of FL Studio is the amount of plugins available for it, you know, so the add-ons that you can use for it, uh, also the different um, sound samples that are available for it. Um, audio recording itself, oddly enough, is, you know, something that's a little difficult to set up in FL Studio. I'll get into that later. But um, another, you know, standard everybody likes, uh, GarageBand for Mac um, because it's free and, you know, it does a lot of what the larger, more expensive programs will do. So why not? Um, third in my list is the audio interface. Uh, an audio, and, you know, this is the piece of equipment that, you know, People getting started usually have no idea what it's for. You know, it seems like an awfully expensive piece of equipment, and you know, why do we need it? Um, an audio interface, you know, basically allows you to connect, you know, your various input devices, whether that's microphones or live instruments. You know, connecting an, elect an electric guitar, or electric piano. Um, you know, this basically this device converts the signal from those instruments to something the computer can understand. Um, so things to consider there are how many instruments do you want to record at once? You know, do you, are you just going to have soloists or podcasters or are you planning on having a band in there? If so, you need quite a few connections. Um, as I said, ours is a fairly small studio. So what we've opted for is an interface that has two input channels. So this allows us to, you know, record two microphones at the same time or hook up our uh, our keyboard and, you know, a microphone at the same time. So if a singer-songwriter wanted to come in and play the keyboard and sing at the same time, they could. Um, it also enables for something called ambient miking, which, you know, is just using two, two microphones to capture a stereophonic image of the entire room. Um, you know, which again, you know, that's, and you know, one technique, one approach that you can have in addition to just, you know, a single microphone mono recording. So, uh, so like I said, the one we use is the Focusrite 2i4, um, really larger professional models. You know, if you, if you wanted to record a full band, You'd need something like the Motu 8 Pre, which has eight inputs, um, or professional models include the Apogee Symphony 16x6 Thunderbolt. Uh, Thunderbolt is a new technology that's uh, supposed to be the fastest connection out there. Um, other options are uh, FireWire and USB is probably the most common. Uh, we use a USB interface. Um, and you know the main the main difference there is one whether your computer is compatible with those, you know does it have those connections, and two is speed. You know um, what happens if you don't have enough speed? You know you get 
uh, what's called a latency issue, uh, which for podcasting isn't much of a big deal, but if you're trying to synchronize different tracks together as in a musical recording, then you know I've had a lot of you know rap artists and things like that come into the studio uh, and bring a track, and then you know they go to record their audio, and after we do the playback, they're like, okay, I was right on top of the beat. You know why am I now? you know, half a second behind, and that's due to latency. Okay, so that covers audio interface. Um, microphones, you know, microphones are sort of, you know, your toolbox in a recording studio. You know, this, this determines uh, the different types of recordings you can do. You know, again, you know, the number of them determines how many you can record at once. Uh, things to consider are Dynamic versus condenser microphones. Um, dynamic microphones, uh, such as the Shure M SM57s and SM58s, are sort of your, you know, industry standard in the sense that you know they've been called sort of Swiss Army knives of the microphone families. Uh, they're they tend to be fairly durable uh, and they produce good quality sound. Um, Again, those are dynamic microphones. Uh, condenser microphones tend to be, you know, I, the good ones anyway, tend to be much more expensive. Uh, they also break more easily. Um, it's, it's really a difference in, in sound quality. I mean, you know, the condenser microphones give you sort of a smoother texture in, you know, the recording. Um, but again, there's you know the durability issue and the price issues. Um, you know the new U87 was you know really big with professional recording studios for a long time. Um, it runs you know several thousands of dollars to buy one of those. Um, the Blue Blue Yeti is a great podcasting microphone, uh, as, uh, and the Blue Bluebird is you know a sort of mid-range condenser microphone that you could look, in, look into. Uh, MXL makes sort of Chinese knockoffs of Newman's U87, so, you know, if you're looking for an affordable option but want, you know, to see what, you know, a professional condenser microphone might sound like, you know, MXL might be an option for you. Studio headphones, you know, uh, we use to basically monitor, you know, uh, this enables people to listen to what's being recorded as they're recording another track over it. So studio headphones are essential for, you know, uh, monitoring the sound that's going on. Um, important things to consider there are isolation and their frequency range. Um, sure, and Sennheiser uh, both have really top of the line models. Uh, we use a Sony um, professional isolation headphones, uh, they run about $100. Um, studio monitors. Um, studio monitors are most important, really, when you get into the mixing and mastering stage, if you get there. I mean, you know, a lot of people are just worried about, you know, recording a track and, you know, having something to take home with them. So you may not even get into studio monitors, but... Um, but it's great to have a couple of, you know, speakers or monitors to play back so other, everyone can listen at the same time. Um, and again, if you want, if anybody wants to get into, you know, professional level mixing uh, and things like that, then you need a good set of studio monitors. Uh, we have a set of Yamaha HS series. Uh, other common uh, companies to look for are JBL and KRK. Beyond that, you need cables to connect, connect everything. Uh, you know, once you've got all this equipment, you need a way to connect it together, and there are various cables to do that. Uh, brand here is not terribly important. I mean, most people agree that a cable's a cable. Uh, Mogami is a standard. Uh, we use live wire in ours because they're a little cheaper, but still just as good. Um, let's see. So your XLR cables are the ones that connect your microphones. Uh, TRS cables will connect either electronic instruments or they connect uh, from your interface to your speakers for the output. 
Um, then you have some that, you know, go from one to the other. So you can have an XLR to a TRS or vice versa. Um, MIDI tables, if you have any MIDI instruments. Um, and we'll get into MIDI in a minute. But, um, uh, you know, the next thing on the list, again, is instruments. So, uh, you know, again, this is all about, you know, how complicated you want to get. You know, you can, I, when I first got here, we had just, you know, a USB microphone attached, you know, to our computer, and that was it. Um, again, that's limited in a certain aspect. Uh, since then, you know, we've added the additional audio interface, and, you know, uh, we've added in a, a full-size keyboard, uh, we've got an acoustic guitar, we've got a set of bongos, a ukulele, recorder, um, we're adding a mini co MIDI controller soon. Uh, MIDI controller, what it is, I mean, you know, a lot of people have seen them, they look like a keyboard, but it's not really a keyboard. Uh, there's no sound that comes out of it, you know, until you hook it up to a computer. Uh, what it is, is a, a device that controls, you know, purely electronic in instruments, you know, um, instruments that are exist only within you know a computer electronic environment uh, MIDI if you're unfamiliar with it is musical instrument digital interface um, it's one of the most common standards for electronic music um, it's what produces all of the ringtones on the phones it's you know it's used in everything from children's toys up to you know professional elect electronic music so um, and then beyond that, there's other additional things you can add. Um, mic stands, obviously, to hold up the microphones. Uh, music stands, I, I recommend having at least one, you know, even if you don't get anybody in there to read music, it's always handy to have something if somebody has a script for their podcast or, um, you know, if they wrote a song and, you know, want to read the lyrics, then, you know, a music stand is helpful. Um, Amplifiers just give additional options. You know, you don't need an amplifier to record an electric guitar. What you need is an, uh, a TRS cable that will, you know, connect from directly from the electric guitar to the audio interface. Uh, amplifiers, you know, some guys will use them just um, to get sort of a more natural live sound. Uh, we've tried that you know, sort of with that um, ambient miking technique I mentioned earlier, you know, if you have a large group and you still want to, you know, record your piano, then, you know, we hook the keyboard up to the amplifier and record it that way so that other people can play additional instruments and you can have, you know, as many people as you want in there, uh, which is great for a group of kids who just want to play around with every instrument that's in the studio. Uh, so beyond that, a headphone splitter, you know, if you have you know, four different head, uh, sets of headphones and want to adjust the volume on each of them, um, you know, and everybody can set their own levels, then that's useful. Uh, a preamp. Um, microphone signals do not generally come in at the level that you would need to record. Uh, so a preamplifier uh, basically takes that microphone signal and amplifies it before sending it to the audio interface. Um, there are ways to get around that. I mean, you know, uh, Audacity, which is a program we use for audio recording a lot, I mean, you know, you can go in there and just amplify the signal after you've recorded it. Uh, you know, you may get more noise that way, but you can edit that out as well. Um, so anyway, a, a preamp is recommended, but, um, but there are ways to get around it. Um, analog mixer, we, we haven't used this in our studio yet. I mean, you know, uh, your digital audio workstation should come with some type of mixer in it. Now, it's all electronic based, but it does the same thing as an analog mixer. So do you need to invest in that? You know, um, a lot of people think it looks cool. A lot of people like the fact that you can play with the knobs, you know, but is it necessary? Um, Acoustic panels and bass traps. So, you know, a lot of people see these and they think this is your soundproofing. Um, it's not actually soundproofing. What it is is sound isolation. Um, 
it, it's sound treatment. Uh, it takes away certain wavelengths which allow easier manipulation of your audio signal after it's been recorded. Um, soundproofing is actually uh, determined more by the thickness of your walls and you know how well isolated the actual room is. You know whether there are any windows or things like that. And beyond that, uh, other software. Um, determined by project complexity, whether you do want to do audio only or MIDI only. Like I said, you know, um, we use FL Studio. Um, if I have somebody who wants to create an electronic beat and then, you know, record their voice over it or something like that, if they only want to come in and record themselves singing or playing guitar, then I will opt for the completely free and open source Audacity. Uh, Audacity is a free open source program uh, which does a lot of the things that a full digital audio workstation would do, but it doesn't have any of the electronic elements to it. Uh, you can't create, you know, you have to have audio coming in to Audacity. It's, you know, it's sort of like the modern version of uh, your old tape recorders, and it works very similar. I'll, I'll show it to you really, really quickly. Uh, this is Audacity. You know, you've got your record button, your play button, your stop button. So anybody can, you know, get into this program and start recording right away. You know, hit record. It creates, you know, either a mono or stereo track depending on what you've selected, and it's recording my voice already. Uh, if I want to multi-track, all I do is stop that, hit record again, and now I'm recording over the first recording that I did. So now I've got myself talking twice. Um, and there are all kinds of effects that you can add in here. Um, you know, Audacity is just a fun program to play around with and it's very easy to use. So I highly recommend that for anyone who's just starting with the audio recording idea and, you know, just wants to play around with audio recording um, or has patrons who want to do that. Um, so that's quick introduction to Audacity. Um, other options are Logic Pro, uh, which is industry standard for um, MIDI sequencing. So sort of the opposite end, you know, that's all of the electronic beats and things like that. Um, <coughs> everything MIDI um, and everything that you can do with MIDI um, is in Logic Pro. Uh, Logic Pro, I believe, is only available for Mac. Uh, other than that, uh, if anybody is, you know, if you have patrons interested in music notation, I mean, you know, this is something that interests me personally since I've been a composer and, you know, written my own music. Um, music notation programs, uh, Finale is a big one, uh, Sibelius is the alternative. Um, Noteworthy Composer is one that I like to use. Uh, it's a very affordable program and, you know, does a lot of what the larger ones can do. Uh, MuseScore is a new one that's been popular with kids. Um, it's it's a free open source program and, you know, allows you to upload your files and, and share and, you know, it, it, it builds a community as well, which is kind of nice. Anyway, I think I've talked plenty about the equipment, so let's get more into what we've been doing with the studio. Um, Session types, you know, just to give you an example of the kinds of sessions and groups that we've had in our studio, um, they, you know, I, I separate them into two types. I, you know, we have small groups and individuals who basically, you know, make an appointment with me and come in, you know, they usually have a project in mind. Um, if they don't, then we, w we work on general audio techniques and I give them an introduction to Audacity and FL Studio, similar to what I'm doing here. Um, for large groups, um, we've developed a couple of things. Uh, I've developed an in-house STEAM program, uh, which incorporates two weeks of 3D printing, two weeks of audio recording, and two weeks of computer programming. Um, so this is generally, uh, it's ages 9 to 12 is what we've done, and it usually gets a group of about 10 kids. Um, so, you know, getting 10 kids in this small studio has been an interesting challenge. And, um, you know, I'll show you sort of the workflow that I go through later on um, to explain how that works. But uh, to give you an idea of, you know, what our final product sounds like, uh, we treat it as sort of a 
collaborative songwriting uh, endeavor, and this was the result, or a part of the result, of the first steam train class that we did. So, you know, typical kids, I mean, you know, they, they get excited, they, you know, it's it's tough to rein in the energy sometimes, but, you know, the idea is to give them a framework where they can experiment a little bit with audio recording and learn something out of it, so. Uh, another group that I've worked with is Delray Students First. Uh, they're all students from Village Academy here in Delray Beach. Um, and they, they've come in a couple times. They were really excited about when they saw the recording studio because they enjoyed doing their own little um, rap projects. Um, so we came up with an assignment for them where they went home and chose some sort of factual information that they were studying and wrote a rap about it. Uh, and the next week they all came in and um, basically I created the beat for them to work with and over top of that you know they they wrap their script or improvise in some cases but uh, uh, one of the kids really nailed it at the end so you know to give you an idea of how that turned out this was this is um, his report was on the land of the Nile so Egypt So again, that's an idea of what we've done there. Uh, we've had some some teens in the room doing projects as well. Uh, we we took part in the teen video challenge recently and had a group in there. Um, sometimes I will just get uh, large groups of teenagers from the community that want to come in and do sort of a rap cipher. Uh, if you're not familiar with the term, a rap cipher is, you know, a group of guys get together and, you know, do some kind of freestyle rap together. Um, so, you know, sometimes they bring their own beat or find one that they would like to use. Other times I will provide one for them. Um, and we've had varying success with that. But, uh, yeah. Other times we'll get individual songwriters or rappers in. Uh, we had a, a duo of two friends who uh, had written some songs together. They didn't really have any accompaniment, but you know they had written out lyrics. They had practiced at home and you know came up with this, which I thought sounded rather nice. So I thought I'd share. <laughs> Tension down to hell. 
next. I mean, you know, we get instrumentals as well. Uh, we had one in particular. Um, this this kid uh, participated in the Steam Train program, and I, his dad uh, works professionally as a bassist, so he's learned some guitar and, you know, just wanted to come in and do a little demo recording one day. So uh, I'll play his for you as well. Still going. Still going. Pause that one. And then. That's really nice. What kind of instrument was that? That's uh, electric guitar. Wow, that was a guitar. Yep. Wow, that's great. Uh, so, you know, not all of the projects that we do in the recording studio are necessarily, you know, musical. I mean, we've had a lot of interesting um, uh, people have, uh, a couple of people have come in to record their own audiobooks. Uh, one guy came in to do a dissertation project. Uh, he was doing what meditation exercises for golfers. Uh, he was like a sports management uh, doctorate. But, um, it's really cool. Yeah. Uh, uh, what? One kid really impressed me. Uh, he came. He was visiting us from Connecticut, I think, and uh, he came in with his brother. And you know, this kid was eight years old, and you know, he's he's written his own like fifty-page novel, basically, um, and wanted to sit there and record an audiobook version of it. So I said, "Great, uh, you know, I'll play just the first little snippet of it for you, uh, get an idea of it." Book One, Evil Emerald, by Joshua Island, for a novel, Jules. August 13, 2014, a novel, fiction. This story begins with us eating. That's right, me and my best friend, Brooklyn White. My mom gave us some homemade chili. Mmm, that was good. Boom. What's that? I asked. Oh, that's probably just thunder. If I knew the truth, alien forces were coming to destroy the planet. I passed book a note. Help aliens. Time to brush your teeth. Yes, Mom. I woke up. My blinking clock said, said that was 3 o'clock. It was actually 1.30 a.m. Just look, wake up. Huh? Get up. Mom's gone. Skitter, skitter. Yikes, bugs all over the place. Let's get out. I packed up six cans of baked beans, four bottles of water, and a box of matches. Slam! I closed the door. All right. That's really cool. That's yeah. Cool. So uh, you know, we get some pretty creative kids in the studio sometimes. Wow. Uh, and la the last one I want to share with you uh, is actually one of the first projects that I did in our studio here. Um, in Delray Beach, we have a large Haitian Creole population, and um, one of the first groups that I had in there were two brothers who, you know, they they didn't know much about audio recording. One of them was 10, the other was 8, and, you know, they just wanted to record their voices, basically, and play around with the instruments. So I said, why not? You know, this, this is a new project, so... Let's try it. And, you know, they came up with their own full CD of, you know, everything from, you know, taking solos on piano and organ to um, uh, from what they did, like their own impressions of what opera music sounded like. And um, and they did some Haitian Creole monologues and things like that, too. Um, I don't speak Haitian Creole myself, but I've been told that nothing of this was offensive. So I'm going to play it for you now. So, 
again, it's just nice to hear, you know, the kids having fun in there. Um, it, it's nice to get that kind of cultural record, too. Um, right. It's yeah. also really cool to hear the different voices on audio. I mean, it really just expresses this artwork. And then you can kind of couple that with the different Adobe Creative Suite programs with visual. It's really cool. Kind of right. what you do. It's really cool. Right. Uh, move on from there a little bit. Uh, you know, to give you an idea of, you know, the different type of patron needs that we get in the studio, you know, these are some of the most common things that I hear when, you know, patrons come to me looking to use the recording studio. Uh, first one is just, you know, I want to record my voice or my instrument. And, you know, that's an easy request. I mean, you know, because it's generally audio only, I go straight to Audacity. I don't worry about the digital audio workstation. I open Audacity. I hit record. You know, we can do multi-tracking multi if we want. We can edit it, you know. Uh, so that's the easiest scenario. Uh, second is, you know, I've written some songs in my notebook and would like to record them. Um, you know, so you've got, you know, a lot of people who want to be singer songwriters, but, you know, may not be that musically inclined, you know, or, you know, maybe they've taken some vocal lessons, maybe they haven't. Um, you know, so the first question I ask is, you know, do they have an accompaniment track? Do they know what an accompaniment is? And if not, would they like to make one with me? And some do, some don't. You know, sometimes you know the acapella version works just just fine, like the duet that I played for you earlier. Other times, you know, they get a lot out of you know creating a compliment. You know, learning about you know how harmony can affect you know what they do and you know affect the feel of their song. Um, so that's scenario two. Uh, scenario three uh, is usually, you know, with rap artists, we get a lot where they come in and say, I found a free beat on YouTube and want to record a rapper freestyle over it to then, you know, post on SoundCloud or, you know, sell it in some way. Um, and these guys, I usually have to give a little lecture on because those free beats that they found on YouTube generally aren't free for recording. You know, a free download does not grant permission to record. Um, which is something a lot of people don't understand. I mean, you know, uh, Cash Money AP is one of the most popular YouTubers, you know, creating these free beats, and, you know, he advertises them as such. But then if you look on his YouTube site and click on the link that says, you know, go to my pay site to license this, you know, you realize it's $50 per use. Um, so, you know, I always try to make people aware of that. Um, and that's not to say there aren't you know, free beats out there that you can legitimately use. Uh, Creative Commons is a great option, you know, um, and I found one, uh, the Free Music Archive has a lot of Creative Commons beats and other, you know, music that people have used, or uh, people have created, which are essentially free to use. I mean, Creative Commons usually requires, you know, I, if you haven't gotten into Creative Commons, there are various different licenses which basically specify ahead of time what you're allowed to do with that music. You know, um, they may just want you to recognize them and give attribution. So, you know, this was created by so and so, and I'm using it in my project. You know, that does, you know, you can use it for commercial purposes, but you know, they they just want credit for it. Um, Others, you know, will say that they don't want you using it for commercial purposes. Others say that you have to share it under the same license that they did. Um, so I, I definitely recommend everyone, you know, as far as librarians are concerned, to check out Creative Commons because it is one of the things that's, you know, changing how we work with copyright. Um, and going on to the next slide. Okay, talking more about Steam Train. Um, as I mentioned, Steam Train is a six week program, age, open ages nine to 12, includes two weeks of 3D printing, two weeks of audio production, and two weeks of scratch computer programming. Um, for the audio production portion, uh, what I do essentially is week one is all about creating some sort of four bar accompaniment. <coughs> uh, this, you know, then week two, what we do is we record a melody or improvise solos over that accompaniment. 
So, you know, the four bar accompaniment gives us a framework to work within. It also introduces them to the digital audio workstation and takes them through the whole process of creating a beat. Um, you know, so week one, you know, the workflow is sort of, you know, create the drum beat, you know, get a rhythmic pattern going that then you can build off of. Uh, baseline is usually next that establishes the key that you're working in. Um, and then you can add additional harmonies onto that using piano or, or guitar sounds. Um, and again, you know, I understand, you know, not everyone running this is going to be a professional musician who, you know, understands how to work with harmony. And, you know, this is usually the thing that the kids need most help with. Uh, rhythm, you know, drum beats are fairly easy to fake um, because, you know, you don't have to worry about things like dissonance to determine whether it sounds good. Um, and do you run these as 60-minute classes? Uh, yes, they are generally 60-minute classes. Yeah, sometimes we run a little over, but generally it's 3.30 to 4.30 on Thursdays. Um, once, you know, once we've established the accompaniment, you know, I take them into the mixer a little bit to explain a little bit of the process of mixing, um, just, you know, getting them to adjust the volume levels of each track to sort of balance it, you know, gets them to ask questions about, you know, what sounds good, you know, gets them to listen to each of the parts, um, you know, and understand, you know, if something sounds too loud or if you want to bring something else out, you can do that. Uh, you can pan uh, the various tracks uh, so that one, an, an instrument may appear more on the right side of your headphones versus the left side. You know, uh, panning is all about adjusting where things are in the audio mix. Okay. Um, and then, like I said, once they have the four-bar accompaniment, you know, week two is all about... This is all about what they really want to do in the studio, which is get into the recording booth and, you know, either sing or play an instrument. Um, and not everyone wants to do that either. You know, if someone really doesn't want to perform, you know, then I have them be the audio technician. And, you know, they'll sit and work the digital audio workstation. They'll give cues to the people doing the performance in the room. Um, and then once all of that is put together, you know, if there's time, I will help them, you know, put everything into the playlist where, you know, <clears throat> that's sort of the final product, which then you can export to put onto a CD, uh, which gives them a nice take home and way to remember the class. But anyway, uh, next thing I'd like to do is sort of demonstrate that week when workflow that I go through. Um, to give you an idea of how FL Studio works and, you know, just the process. Uh, I'm going to exit out of PowerPoint here and get into FL Studio. Okay. So this is FL Studio. Uh, as I said, it's a full service digital audio workstation. Uh, it has lots of, you know, different tools to work with, you know. Um, Hang on, I'm going to take a little water here. But generally, it starts off in what's called the channel rack. Uh, the channel rack basically is where you select what instruments you're going to use. Uh, the idea is to develop several different patterns that then you can overlay on top of one another. Uh, with the steam training class, I generally stick to one pattern. Um, but uh, they start you off with sort of a basic drum kit. Uh, you've got your kick drum, uh, which is the bass drum and the drum set. Uh, the hat is a cymbal and the snare drum, uh, most people know. But the clap is really an electronic sound. It's meant to mimic, you know, a hand clap. Um, and it's good for accenting certain beats. Um, I, don't, I don't always use it. Uh, so, if you want to change an instrument, what you do is you go over to PAX here, which has all the instrument samples that you can use in FS Studio, and there's more on their site that you can download if that isn't enough. 
though they give you quite a few to look through. Um, if you go just in drums, look at percussion, you know, I have all these different instruments to choose from. Uh, and I could sample each of those, you know. So this is what their cowbell sounds like. This is their tambourine sound. Uh, I'm going to add a set of claves. I like this one here. So I'm going to pull that in right over where it says clap, and I'm going to change it to that clave. So um, creating a drum beat. Um, again, this is you know this is something kids don't necessarily need too much supervision on. I mean, really, you know, as long as you don't get overly complicated or overly simple, then you know it will sound like a four-bar drum beat. Or um, they start you off with one bar uh, with 16, 16 subdivisions. If anybody has taken any music lessons, these are you know your sixteenth notes. Each of these is a switch, which basically you know says to play this sound at this particular moment in time. So if I want just you know the basic kick drum, you know metronome, I'd do something like this and then play that. So that gets my basic drum beat. Um, common to most rap and rock music, you will have a strong beat on beat three. So this is beat one, beat two, beat three is here. So I'm going to put a snare hit on there, and now I get this. So you know that kind of emphasizes that one and three. Uh, now again, you know, kids will come up with their own things. You know, they may, you know, put a couple extra things in here uh, for the kick drum, and you know, add a few here for the snare, and then you get this. So again, it helps to know what you're doing, but you know, it's not always necessary. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of leeway with creating a drum beat. Um, so, uh, with a hat symbol, you know, most common thing to do in rock and rap music is just to have it play eighth notes. So, an eighth note would be every other switch, which is what I've done here. Then you get this. You can almost hear that. Mute these. There, you can hear the hat symbol going there. Last of all, I'm going to add a clave pattern. This is a 3-2 clave pattern, which is, you know, used in Latin music and other things like that. So I say 3-3-2 because it's, you know, you have three switches, three switches, and two. Actually, that's not true. I mean, what you have is three hits on the clave for the first half of the bar and then two for the second half of the bar. So that sounds like this. Okay, so altogether I have and it's beginning to sound like music at least. Um, then we gonna, have, yes. have a um, David's asking if wanted, can you get smaller notes than a 16? I believe so. I mean, you know, it's yes. Uh, I have done that before. Um, um, yeah, you, you can. Uh, I'm trying to remember the way to do it. Uh, what, it's what you can do. Um, you know, if there's a particular sound or fast pattern that you want, like you know, um, one of them that gets used a lot is uh, this sort of um, triplet pattern on the cymbals. This like, you know, and you, you're hearing that a lot in rap music Can lately. You, David's suggesting do you just change the time signature? Yeah, I, you know, I, I was looking at that earlier and that, I, I was actually looking for, where I would do that this morning, and you know, I'm, <laughs> I, I know, I, like in Logic, that you can change it. I'm sure GarageBand you can change it as well. So I'm sure right. there's a way. Yeah, I'm sure it. there's a way. It's just not very emphasized in FL Studio because 
FL Studio tends to cater toward, you know, rap and rock music in 4-4 time. So, um, but yes, there, there are ways to do that. Thanks for the question, David. Yep. Um, so, once we've established that, I'm just going to, you know, if I need an extra bar, I just click out here and it gives me an extra bar. I'm going to extend what I've done so far. So now I've got at least a QB pattern. Okay. Okay. So once I have the underlying rhythmic pattern, next is to add some sort of harmonic element. Uh, this may start with a bass line, or you can go straight to a keyboard or um, guitar. Uh, your two most common, uh, two most common accompaniment instruments. Um, but say we. Uh, actually, I'm just, yeah, in the interest of time, I'm going to go straight there. Uh, what I'll do is just, yes? A right click. No, you added, to add your, your, your um, Yeah, to add, you just click the little plus sign down here. Um, I add an empty track, and then I select okay. my instrument over here. Thanks. So I want instruments, keyboard, uh, let's see. I'll go with an electric keyboard. So I paste that in. This gives you this. This allows you to sort of sample and play with you know the sound of the instrument. So this is what the instrument should sound like. Okay, and I'll close out of that. Now, to input the actual notes for a piano, you know you're not going to use the channel rack because that's only going to give you one pitch. I um. Uh, since since percussion is you know an unpitched instrument, you know you can do that with percussion, but with a piano, you know you're going to want more than one note, hopefully, uh, more than one different pitch. Um, so if I were to do this in channel rack, you get something like this. Yeah, which sounds okay, but you might want more variety than that. So then what we do is we right click on the electric piano and go into our piano roll. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure GarageBand has something like this uh, where it's basically a matrix where you have vertically the pitches that you want to use and horizontally the time. Uh, so um, a lot of times what I'll do in the class is just set them up with some sort of, you know, standard progression, uh, one, two, five, one works well. Um, so, um, in the key of C, that's going to be a C, C major question. Okay. Uh, C major, D minor, uh, G major, and back to C major. Um, so again, you know, these are things that I learned through musical training. Uh, if anybody wants, you know, a reference or wants to learn about musical theory, I recommend a site called musictheory.net. Uh, it's got some great training exercises and explanations for everything you need through all four years of theory that I got in university. So. <laughs> Is that uh, free resources? Yeah. That's awesome. So, uh, to input these chords, uh, I will put the note at the space and time that I want it. If I want to make it longer, I drag the end of it. So, I'll make this a bar long. So, again, you know, 16 subdivisions, that gives you your first full bar. And let's see, there's my E and my G. So, that gets me a chord up front. Uh, actually, I'll make it two bars. Why not? We have an eight-bar phrase, so I'm going to make it full two bars, and then I'll go to the next. And so I want my D major chord here. Come to an F and down to an A here. That's that two bars, and then a G, and a B, 
be. It's amazing. It's different than GarageBand, this program, but I'm sure it's the same as you start to work with right. it. Right. There's, there's a lot of similarities. And, and GarageBand does provide kind of like the training on like the, the guitar and the keyboard itself. Right. So it's. Really okay, cool. All right. So I put in a basic, you know, uh, two, five, one progression. So now my pattern is going to sound like this. Oh, what happened to my drum? <laughs> okay. Uh, I see. Okay. I was thinking I had an eight bar pattern. I have a two bar pattern. Uh, okay. So I need to go back. All right. I'm going to shorten all this. All right, so now it should fit over the rhythmic, the rhythmic phrase that I created earlier. So we have now. So that gives me both the rhythmic foundation and the harmonic foundation to work with. Um, Very nice. And, you know, I, I usually also have the kids talk about, you know, what tempo do they want the song at? You know, what speed do they, do they want a slow song or a fast song? And that's simply a matter of adjusting a metronome up here, which you can do while you're playing it. And typically the kids, you know, the first question they ask is, how fast can it go? Exactly. <laughs> awesome. That was really great, um, Ben. Um, do we have any questions from the field? You can either speak up or type something in the um, chat board there. Well, that was very good and informative, Ben. Okay. Thank you so much um, for sharing with us. Give a, a couple more seconds for any questions to fly our way. Uh, I, I'll skip. The one slide there, I just want to give you, you know, a couple other resources. Um, okay. I mentioned musictheory.net already, you know, if anybody needs music theory and oral training exercises. Uh, Hillsborough County has a nice quick start guide for their recording studio, uh, which goes over, you know, some more in-depth descriptions of some of the equipment and how to use it. Um, it also gives a basic introduction to GarageBand, if that's what people are used to using. Okay. Um, also, I mentioned the free music archive earlier. Uh, IMSLP, if anyone is looking for free sheet music, uh, this is the place to go. IMSLP has been called the Wikipedia for musicians. Awesome. Um, you know, so if, if it's in the public domain, chances are it's on IMSLP. Um, you do have to be a little careful because it's a Canadian site. You know, people upload from all over the world, and copyright restrictions are different in different countries. So, you know, make sure that it's public domain here before you use it. Okay. 
Uh, and if anybody's looking for free sound effects, you know, we've used free sound for a couple of different audio recording projects just, you know, to get some sound effects in there. Okay. Christina does have a question. She yes. wants to know if you offer classes to both kids and the public. Right now, as I mentioned, our focus has been mostly on kids. I, you know, I am, you know, a children's librarian working in the children's department. Uh, but, you know, with our new director, I, there is a possibility that we'll be expanding our educational opportunities for adults soon. So that could be coming soon. That's awesome. awesome. These resources are really great, and I will um, get these out on the interactive PDF where I will have um, been recording as well as his slides. So um, you guys can be looking for that. Um, anything else, Ben, before that you want to finish up with? This is really good information. And those resources are really can be priceless. <laughs> mm -hmm. So thank you for sharing those. You're welcome. And then I do want to let everybody know that on Monday, we will be starting an Adobe Photoshop uh, certification course through the lynda.com program. Um, they have, and this is going to be the first time that we're doing this, so we'll see through this process kind of what it's going to be like. Uh, the first, I think, three to four hours is actually on the certification. Um, the, we'll, then we'll do a fundamentals training, which is about a 16 hour course and then a teacher learning, which the whole course is going to be 20 to 24 hours. And it'll probably bring us through um, June and July and possibly um, August. Um, we're going to be meeting Mondays for 90 minutes and welcome anybody. And it'll be a nice little experience to see, you know, how well this works for everybody. Um, anything else? Ben, I just really want to thank you for being willing to share with us. Um, great information. And um, are you open for questions if anybody has them? Absolutely, yeah. No, if anybody has questions, uh, feel free to email me. Um, my email is ben.con at delraylibrary.org. Um, and yeah, no, I'd love to talk with you. Awesome. Uh, you know, if anybody has questions or you know um, needs help with setting up a recording studio or just wants to talk about the latest in audio recording. Uh, yeah. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks, for everybody, for showing up. And thank you, Ben, for presenting for us today. Thanks for having me. No other questions? I'll go ahead and sign off. And we'll see you next month.